You didn't mention my 14-yard swimming certificate, Val. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure, privilege, and honor to be um, with you today at your graduation. Welcome to our graduates, families, friends, and uh, supporters on this occasion of great celebration. But you know, it's also a somber event because it marks the culmination of years of serious and sustained efforts at study, grappling with important subjects, as you all have been, which have defined our past, which also explain our present and will help shape our futures. So it's a formal and serious occasion because if you're not going on to further study, then today marks your passage into the world of work where you will find that the SOAS stamp is a very, very useful stamp to have on your life's passport. It's really helped um, me very much, given me a framework in my career. And you, the graduates, of course, are the uh, focus of our attention, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you as a fellow SOASian, because as Val said, I had the privilege of um, carrying out postgraduate studies here many, many years ago. I'm sure looking at me, you might find that hard to believe that I said many, many years ago, but it's true. <laughs> Although in many ways, it seems just like yesterday. And to those of you who are family members, well, I know the pride that you must be feeling um, because I've also attended a similar ceremony for the eldest of my four children. And um, I, I now have the pleasure of congratulating this year's um, graduates um, at uh, SOAS. So I suppose to use a football metaphor, this must qualify as a hat trick, right? <laughs> now, um, as you embark on this new exciting journey, I thought I'd just share some reflections with you of somebody who began this uh, similar journey um, a while ago. The ideology, exuberance, and energy of youth is a very powerful combination, graduates, and it can uh, set the world on fire. But like fire, if it becomes rampant, wanton, and simply just anarchic, it can have a destructive element. But properly harnessed, it's a very, very positive force. So when you are young, you should want to mold the world to your ideas, values, and ideals. And as you get older and you find that you're forced to conform, then you find that you, you are increasingly molding yourself to the world rather than the other way around. But I would say to you, don't ever lose that youthful desire to challenge the status quo. And that is the theme of what I want to say to you today, because that positive use of the disruption of youth is very important. And I'm not saying to you that um, you should remain rigid with views that are static throughout your life. I mean, a person's opinions and views do evolve, and self-examination is important, but retain your essence and uh, what makes you all special. So challenge the status quo in a meaningful way, not just for the sake of disruption. That's an admirable quality and it often marks out those who bring about change for good in our world. So I've had the privilege in my career of meeting some of these uh, disruptors who began this journey when they were young, um, like, for example, Dr. Nawala Saadawi, the Egyptian pioneering feminist. She's a medical doctor. She's also a writer, an activist, a campaigner. At the age of nearly 90, she's just published her memoirs, Daughter of Isis, Walking Through Fire. And that is what Nawal has done. I saw her not so long ago here in London a couple of months ago. And we were talking about her, you know, long career walking through fire, not afraid to speak truth to power, campaigning for women's rights and status and so on, imprisoned for being too outspoken. And she is still doing that at nearly the age of 90. And that's somebody who is truly inspiring. I also think of the late, great Wangari Mathai, the Kenyan environmental activist, whom I also had the privilege of seeing. You know, she was derided, wasn't she, for her efforts to plant trees and to try to get people to be aware of the environment, awarded in 2011 the Nobel Peace Prize. And, um, you know, one of the many things that she has said that has always stuck in my mind and is a bit of a mantra for me, which is, you cannot enslave a mind that knows itself, that values itself, that understands itself. And she's right. And so that's what you must do. Value your mind, what you have learned here. Maintain that at all costs. Keep on learning, because it's a process that should stay with you throughout your life and retain your integrity. So 
First, you've also got to work out what your ideals are, even if you have not found those yet. And that is where I think two principal qualities are very, very important. And they are passion and compassion. Because with compassion, you can identify what is right to do in the world, what injustices need to be you know, exposed. And with passion, you get the energy, the enthusiasm to really do something to, uh, you know, what is right, to be moved into action and to, to right wrongs. And I think a life that is devoid of passion is one which is rather depleted. So I want to tell you about a member of my own family who had passion, compassion, ideals, vision in great abundance. My great-grandfather, Sheikh Babikir Badri. Now, he was born at the turn of the last century and he was the pioneer of female education in the Sudan where I was born. So before he started educating girls, there were no schools or education for girls at all. And, you know, he set up in his own, the courtyard of his own home, um, schools for girls. And the community were vilifying his efforts and the British authorities who were in power at the time, the colonial authorities said, Sheikh Babakir, don't persevere with this. Look, you know, you're getting stones thrown at you. You're being ostracized by your community. And he said, no, absolutely not. I don't see why I should educate my boys and not my girls. Um, he had a lot of children because, in fact, he was so pro-women, he married four of them. <laughs> Hence, he had a lot of children. And so, um, you know, I grew up with great aunts, grandmothers, who, if they were alive today, would be well over 100 and could read or write. And the family, um, in 1960, established a university for women in the capital, Khartoum, which to this day has um, young women, not only from Sudan, but other parts of Africa. And, you know, they're educated in all sorts of disciplines. And, you know, they go back to their communities, their villages, their cities or whatever, and their nations, and they contribute to their societies. And so, you know, it's, it's really something which is very, very important, his legacy remains. And as we talk about legacy, I think it would be remiss for me not to mention the legacy, of course, of Nelson Mandela, who earlier this month would have turned 100 years of age. And he is somebody who also, very much like my great-grandfather, swam against the tide. Um, it's easy for us to think, isn't it, of Nelson Mandela as um, this elderly statesman. But, of course, he wasn't um, always like that. Of course, he was old by the time he was released from prison in 1990. But he maintained the, idealis the idealism and the passion that he formed in his youth. And that never left him. Because along with Walter Sisulu and Oliver Tambo, they formed the Youth League of the ANC in 1943-1944. And it was the ANC's Youth League that responded to the state's tightening grip and, and you know, they called for a program of action based on non-violent confrontation. And it's from that point on, when he formed the Youth League of the ANC, that Mandela became immersed in the politics of, of South Africa. So useful to remember that that journey he embarked on that, you know, made him president in 94, he started off as a young person. Well, look, we can't all become, of course, iconic giants like Nelson Mandela, but in our own way, in your own way, you can make a difference. And in my own small way, that's been my guiding principle in my career as a journalist. As Val mentioned, most recently I've written, presented, and produced a, a series of Africa's history, starting from the origins of humankind to the 12th, 13th century. I'm now working on the second series. And you may say, well, we've seen histories of Africa before. What's different about this one? Well, this one is very, very different because it casts the African expert center stage. I also talk to ordinary Africans, and they tell us, you know, what makes their, you know, how their identity is fashioned by their history. So, you know, when I, when I, when I was a student at Oxford, the um, historian Hugh Trevor Roper was coming to the end of his career there. And this was the kind of climate that we are talking about, which sadly to some extent still exists today. So one thing that Hugh Trevor Roper said about African history, perhaps in the future, he said, there will be some African history to teach, but at present there is none or very little. There is only the history of Europeans in Africa. He talked about the unrewarding gyrations of barbarous tribes in picturesque but irrelevant corners of the globe. Now that's somebody speaking in my lifetime. 
And, you know, that is why I believe we need to reconstruct the African continent from an African perspective. We need to put the African intelligentsia centre stage. It's not about closing the door to Western or European traditions. It's about adding and acknowledging that Western knowledge systems do not constitute the only form of thinking. And that's what's great about SOAS. One of the things that makes SOAS unique um, is that the, the academics here are very aware about this movement of decolonizing curriculums. And, um, you know, regardless of where the SOAS academic, uh, academics come from, as I've discovered myself, they have a very enlightened approach to the study of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And um, sadly, though, it will take time for this perspective and approach to filter through to the wider community, politics, the media, you know, society, and culture. Um, just, you know, it's ironic that Africa's history has either been denigrated, written by outsiders, or they've been told they don't have any, because, of course, Africa has got the longest history in the world, because it's where you all originated. If you're not from Africa, then you're an African export. You know, it's the greatest exporter of all time. And so, um, it's, you know, this throwing light on African history, but also giving ownership of Africa's history to the people of the continent themselves is very important. I was discussing this over tea recently with the former deputy president of South Africa, Haklimi Motlanti, and um, he said, you know, owning something is very, very important. And he said, there's an African proverb, which is, when the lions have historians, then the hunters will cease to be heroes. And graduates, seizing control of your own story is critical because you must be the driver of your own life journey, not merely be a passenger or a spectator on that uh, journey. Don't compromise on your values that you have now. Try to create a life of meaning and purpose for yourself and in some way challenge the status quo. It's not all about just having you know, paid employment, it's also about doing uh, voluntary work in your communities. Last October, the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year was youthquake. And youthquake is defined as a significant, significant cultural social change arising from the actions or influence of young people. That's what I urge you to create, a youthquake. Because you're not the next generation, you are the now generation. And as you today rightly bask in the glory of being awarded your degrees, you mustn't lose sight of that. And as your parents perhaps breathe a sigh of relief that at last, just at last, perhaps the bank of mother and father <laughs> might be shutting down as the uh, graduates um, find their, their way in, in paid employment, strike out on your own in the world. Make your family proud, make yourselves proud. Go forth with passion, compassion, ideals and change the world for the better, help eliminate the bad and create the good. Graduands, I have bombarded you with advice. End of sermon, renewed congratulations and may the ceremony begin. Thank you.